if there's even one life that can be saved, then we've got an obligation to try. We will make it easier to keep guns out of the hands of criminals by strengthening the background check system. We will help schools hire more resource officers if they want them. We will make sure mental health professionals know their options for reporting threats of violence. I will direct the Centers for Disease Control to go ahead and study the best ways to reduce it. And Congress should fund research into the effects that violent video games have on young minds. Now, these are a few of the 23 executive actions that I'm announcing today. And I'm calling on Congress to pass some very specific proposals right away. First, it's time for Congress to require a universal background check for anyone trying to buy a gun. Second, Congress should restore a ban on military-style assault weapons and a 10-round limit for magazines. President Barack Obama announcing his future plans for gun control in the United States. Just yesterday, he signed 23 executive orders targeting gun violence in America. They all appear to be fairly innocent. More reporting, more research, more training, more enforcement of existing laws. But Obama's not stopping there. He's calling on Congress to pass a renewed ban on assault weapons and large capacity gun magazines and universal background checks. Obama knows this won't be an easy fight. Are the president's kids more important than yours? Then why is he skeptical about putting armed security in our schools when his kids are protected by armed guards at their school? Mr. Obama demands the wealthy pay their fair share of taxes, but he's just another elitist hypocrite when it comes to a fair share of security, protection for their kids, and gun-free zones for ours. The NRA is not taking this one lying down, as you can tell. It's shaping up to be a long and ugly fight in Washington, both sides bringing kids into the argument, which leaves a, a foul taste in my mouth. How will this play out, and who will emerge victorious? We're fortunate to have with us John Fund, senior editor of The American Spectator. John, let's, uh, let's start with uh, the kids, both sides exploiting the kids here. What do you make of it? Well, obviously it's unfortunate, but I think the bottom line that we should recognize is we've tried to protect kids with gun-free zones in the United States, and it hasn't worked. You know, since 1950, every example of a mass murder, which is four or more people killed by the same person at the same time in the United States, with one exception, has taken place in a place where guns were banned. So clearly, the gun-free zone movement hasn't worked, so we need to rethink at least that. And I agree with the president. Many of his executive proposals are reasonable. But gun-free zones don't work. John, I need to ask you this. There are more than 300 million guns in your country right now. There, there may be more. That's a conservative estimate. 300 million. So no matter what he does now and no matter what Congress does now, how would any of it stop a motivated mass murderer? Well, the ban on assault weapons we've had before. We had it for 10 years. It did very little. And the reason is an assault weapon is a misnomer. It doesn't mean much. It just means a normal hunting rifle uh, that's semi-automatic and that has military-style attachments to it, like a bayonet mount or a flash protector. And it doesn't really mean any suppressor. It doesn't really mean anything. So uh, banning assault weapons makes you feel good. But, you know, 87 percent of gun violence deaths in our country here come from handguns. And by the way, you know, despite all of the headlines and despite the cable news, our rate of gun violence in the United States is actually half what it was 20 years ago. So these incidents get a lot of attention, but fewer people are dying from guns. But as you know, politics are driven by events, and uh, Newtown is a, is a mega event, and so people capitalize on it. I don't, I don't say that to uh, say that uh, I'm not using capitalize as, as a pejorative. I'm just simply saying that the country pays attention to events and it, it drives politics. But let me get back to the basics here. Um, even if they were to ban uh, the sales of all kinds of weapons, with 300 million weapons out there, many of them the kinds that you're talking about, how would a motivated mass murder, and every one of them is motivated, None of this is flash in the pan. None of this is spontaneous. All the evidence suggests that these people who do these kinds of things have been thinking about it for a while, and they've been planning, and they've been planning carefully. So the question is, with respect to those people who are highly motivated 
to create these mega events that drive the agenda, how would they be stopped when they can get access to any one of the 300 million guns that are out there? Well, I agree. And my heart broke at Newtown because I don't live very far from there at all. Um, I think mental health professionals at the state level uh, can do something. You know, Connecticut was one of the six states in the United States that didn't have a law that said if somebody was discovered to have a mental illness that endangered themselves or others, there could be some preventive action taken unilaterally. Uh, the ACLU shot that down in Connecticut just last year. So I think we can change our mental health laws. But as for getting guns out of the hands of those people, it's very difficult. You know, what the president proposed yesterday wouldn't have prevented Newtown. It wouldn't have prevented the Batman shooter in Colorado. I do find it interesting that the president has included some money for armed security in a thousand schools. Now, that's something he poo-pooed just a few weeks ago. And remember, you know, the gun-free zones haven't worked. So I don't think we should arm every school, but I think it would be helpful if we had someone at a school who had a concealed carry permit, who was trained in firearms. And so any killer who was trying to plan where to go would know that there was a chance they could be stopped by someone with a gun at those schools. And remember, you know, the killer in Colorado, the Batman shooter, he had a choice of over 10 theaters to go to in his neighborhood that were showing Batman. He didn't pick the closest. He didn't pick the one that had the most seats. He picked the only one that had a sign up saying it is illegal to carry a gun legal or illegal into this theater. He picked a place where he knew he wouldn't be opposed or shot at. John, I think that Obama is setting the bar pretty low when he says if we can do something to save just one life, one life is important, but doing something to save just one life and proving down the road that with whatever metrics you want to use, that whatever you did, executive action, congressional action, uh, saved a handful of lives. I mean, politically, that's a no-brainer. That's just easy. If we operate a government policy on the basis that we should do everything possible to save anyone, even if it's just one life, we'd never get anything done. We'd never allow people to have cars. We'd never allow people to fly. We'd never allow people to do anything. So at some point, you have to have a cost-benefit analysis here. And I think what the president, for example, is doing is throwing out ideas that sound good, but we need to look at them carefully. The president yesterday claimed preposterously that 40 percent of gun sales in the United States were private and therefore didn't go through background checks. That's ridiculous. The actual number is about 10 percent. He's basing it on a completely flawed federal study that's been discredited and is over 20 years old. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have more registration and background checks, but we also have to recognize their costs involved. You know, if you deny someone um, a gun initially based on a faulty background check and we have something like seven or eight percent of people's you know, claims to want, to, to want to possess a gun, they're rejected simply because of mistaken identity. If we reject people's initial request for a gun, you know, they may be falling prey to a stalker or a rapist or somebody who's trying to threaten them. So, yes, we should have good registration and background checks, but it doesn't mean we jump and pass whatever the president wants because while we may be preventing someone who's a felon or mentally ill from getting a gun, we could also be keeping through bureaucratic mistakes someone who needs a gun desperately for self-defense from getting one when they really need it. Well, the most recent shooters, if we're talking Newtown, if we're talking Aurora, Colorado, I mean, not, none of them would have been in any kind of a mental health a registry. None of them had any uh, criminal backgrounds. Well, yes. However, remember, there was a psychologist who examined Adam Lanza at his high school in Newtown, Connecticut, and apparently found some very, very serious issues. Maybe those should have been reported to authorities, uh, especially when he turned 18. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it would have prevented anything, but there were signs and there are times when the psychologist in Colorado who treated James Holmes knew that he had very, very serious mental problems, and she chose not to report them to authorities. There's some real question as to whether or not she made the right call on that, so maybe we need to adjust the boundary lines there. Here's my question about uh, the mental health issue. If, if people feel that just visiting a psychologist the odd time is going to put them in some sort of mental health registry, whether it's uh, then consequence by preventing uh, a firearm purchase and, and who knows what else, don't you think that would suppress uh, applications for appointments with psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists? Don't you think some people would just kind of keep their issues in the closet? Uh, that's a legitimate objection. Therefore, I think we have to tread very carefully here. 
Remember, right now, it is not against the law for a psychologist or mental health professional to report someone. In fact, all of the laws we have now tend to discourage that, including peer pressure from other psychologists. I'm simply saying maybe we need to move the boundary line just a little bit so that in the case of the psychologist in Colorado who did recognize some violent tendencies in James Holmes, she should have reported those. Again, most people who go to psychologists should go with the full knowledge that there is confidentiality involved. But there have to be exceptions. If you're a psychologist and I come to you and say, I've got a plan to blow up a building tomorrow, you're going to report that. So at some point, we have to draw some new boundary lines. No disagreement there, John. John, thank you very much. Hope we can get to do this yeah. more often. Appreciate sure, your time. Thank you.